everyone. Welcome to Everfree Radio. This is Final Draft, and I'm here today with Jason Teeson, the supervising director of My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. This small show, this kind of upstart program that some of you may have heard of. But anyway, <laughs> welcome, Jason. Hi. Well, I'm glad to be here. Well, you know, first of all, let me just say it's a real honor to be able to speak with you. I know that it's just been a crazy ride this whole year with all that's been going on in the community and with all of the things that have been happening in season two. Let me just say right off the bat, you know, congratulations on a really successful season. I mean, these were some of the best episodes I've seen. Oh, wow. Thanks a lot. Yeah, it's a wild ride. I mean, it's only been, what, two two years for the show being actually on the air and just the community that's exploded around it and for it it's just unbelievable i i've never seen anything like it in my lifetime so that's saying i don't know how much that's saying but (laughs) uh, from my perspective it's saying a lot um so i'm amazed good job to you guys for sticking with the show and thanks for loving it it really makes my job a heck of a lot easier (laughs) and uh and rewarding to see the kind of enthusiasm for the show that you guys have. Well, and I think in the end, it's actually almost a symbiotic relationship. I mean, when I've talked to other production, you know, members of the cast and crew, you know, they say that because there's this supportive online community that's showing this kind of a positive reaction, that it encourages them to do more as well with the show. And it kind of builds up on top of itself, I think. Yeah, it certainly keeps fueling the fire and uh, gets us uh, pumped for the next season and uh, really wanting to try and top ourselves or at least keep that energy flowing. Well, and it's definitely working. I think in a lot of ways, season two had a lot of you know bigger and, and just more amazing elements than season one even had. And season one was incredible, don't get me wrong. <laughs> the bronies out there would rip me to shreds if I claimed season one was in any way deficient, but you guys really expanded the scope a bit in season two. Yeah, I mean, we tried to you know learn from uh, problems and stuff that we encountered in production to try and make the storyboarding and the, the storytelling better, as well as the animation and the layouts and uh, everything. You know, it's just... We try to build upon what we've already done, right? And it's it's always easier in the, the subsequent seasons in a way because you have assets, especially in Flash, you have assets built, things you've already set up and you have systems in place and production lines that are starting to gel and, and everything. So, and especially if everybody stays on board and you get the same crew, people know the rules, they know, you know, how to do things and we, that we've problems that we've solved don't have to be resolved again because people know, okay, I, this is how I do it and things like that. So it just kind of gets to a point where we're just sort of speaking each other's language and stuff. So that definitely is good to hear that we're improving. <laughs> <laughs> well, so maybe in a sense, then you guys kind of got the basis down and now you're able to kind of work a little bit more with the format, work a little bit more with the resources you have to kind of try new things. Because one thing that I noticed over season two that I know that a lot of fans appreciated was that there were a lot more musical sequences in the second season and a lot more grand scale sorts of animations. Would you attribute that then to being a little more comfortable with the format and using, say, Flash animation? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, I mean, a lot of that comes from the scripts, of course, and the songs that are being made. I mean, Daniel's definitely stepped it up, too, as well as Will with the musical score. And also the storyboard artists, you know, season two kind of started a new thing with us, with Jim Miller as the storyboard supervisor. And we kind of set up new systems to kind of improve ourselves and get to a point where we can get grander as well as all the production stuff with animation and layout. And it's just an inevitable step, ho- you know, d- hopefully, that you improve on yourself. So, yeah, I'd say yes. Well, <laughs> I should say, too, that about a month ago, we interviewed Sabrina Alberghetti, a.k.a. Sibzy, about her work with the show. And she said that, you know, that this season has been a, a little bit of a different dynamic, a little more uh, flexible in a sense, just for the same reason that you've been talking about that, you know, you, once you get more used to a system, you can do more with it. And I know that she credited you a lot with some of the, you know, innovations that have happened this season. So, you know, again, congratulations on that. Oh, thanks. Well, I guess you should credit me. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, season one, I mean, any anytime you start with a, a series at the very beginning, there's always these hurdles that you got to get over, like setting up the characters. Who are they? Everyone has to get on the same page. 
who is Rarity? Well, we didn't know, and, and you know, only Lauren knew. And uh, and even then, it was like kind of nebulous in that sense. Like once we got the voice actors in, that kind of helped solidify how they sounded and how they moved, and all that stuff is in the beginning of the season of the, f- the beginning of any series. It's kind of a struggle. It's just a learning curve, right? Mm-hmm. But once you get onto another season, you're just kind of picking up where you left off. So it's a uh, again should always be improving on yourself. Well, so I kind of want to take a step back and look at your broader career. And, you know, you'll have to correct me if IMDb fails me again. <laughs> and it's failed <laughs> me in the past. You've worked on, on a few other shows before this. It's uh, what the internets, what the interwebs tell me is that you've worked on Puka and you've worked on uh, Georgia the Jungle. And my question is, what did you learn from working on those shows that you've since applied to working as the supervising director on My Little Pony? Um, I think the most I learned was from Puka. I mean, I was only on George for a brief period. You know, I was in between seasons, actually. I did two seasons of Puka. And in between those seasons, while there wasn't really anything going on, I moved on to George and supervised the animation. But that was only for the first six episodes and we're just kind of setting it up. But for Puka, I definitely, well, I learned directing in a way. I mean, I started out as an assistant director and I kind of learned, you know, how to deal with crews and getting my ideas out there in, in a way that other people understand and just working the whole system, learned about taking something and moving it from script all the way to the final mix and communicating with everybody. Then directing is is like 90% communicating. You know, I, I really have to take a vision that I have in my head and try to communicate that to someone else who is obviously not in my head. You know, how do I do that? How do I get them on the same page as me? That's a skill that I think being a director definitely pushes you to develop. Well, I was going to say, too, I mean, you've got a lot of different groups to work with in your position. I mean, you've got the storyboard yeah. artists, you've got the layout artists, you've got the, the flash animation programmers, you've got the people over, I suppose, at Top Draw, you know, and you kind of have to coordinate mm-hmm. between all those different groups, don't you? Yeah. And not only that, but we don't make one episode at a time. I mean, we do, but... I'm involved in multiple episodes at once. Like one will be in script, one will be in voice record, one will be in design, another one is in storyboard, all the way through to final mix. I could, like on Puka, it was much more difficult like that where, because they were little seven minute shorts, we had the entire spectrum. There was an episode in script all the way all through to there was something in mix and I had to keep my brain peeled for each one of those episodes at whatever stage they are and people come up to me and ask questions like, oh, in this scene, uh, what do I do here? And they wouldn't even tell me what episode it is. And I'd be like, okay, I just kind of extrapolate from what they're asking me. Oh, that's episode 22. And I know that story is about this. So you must be meaning this. Okay, here's the answer. And it was just like this Rolodex of episodes I had to have in my head at any given time and scenes. And even, you know, on today on Puka, like, or sorry, on on Pony, people ask me things and like, oh, uh, or I come up with a a scene that's like, oh, this is similar to that scene in this episode. Maybe we can extract some elements from that and and repurpose them and make a new animation out of it. You know, you know, secrets out, we reuse things. (laughs) But anyway, it's just kind of like a brain exercise that you got to be able to do having that much info in there. Well, and I think that a lot of uh, members of the community definitely know what it's like to reuse or, or you know, reinterpret existing material, especially the musicians and the, uh, you know, the fan artists out there have been using the various elements of the show. And I should say, though, I mean, watching the episodes, yeah, once in a while you may notice a similar style of uh, animation, but, you know, you guys definitely do a really good job of delineating and it's not like you're seeing the same episode over and over again by any, by any means or any regard. Oh yeah, I mean that's it's uh, it's definitely something that's up to you know it's use discretionary, is that's a word. <laughs> we don't want to repeat ourselves, right? So, uh, but sometimes you know due to production things. I mean, if you've got something similar, why do you do it, right? If you can repurpose it, I mean, it goes all the way back to Hanna Barbera. It's not illegal. <laughs> So I want to go back and look at your role as supervising director for the series. And I wanted to ask you, from the start of a production of an episode, you have a script. 
are you the first person to see that script then? Um, well, I guess in season two, the first person to see this script would have been Lauren and Rob uh, Renzetti. Then it would go through Hasbro and make sure that they're all cool with it. And then it would come down to me and then we would see what we're in for. <laughs> <laughs> And in that season, I would read it over. I mean, we would see everything from premise. You know, it would start with the premise, and then each draft would come through us as well. And if I had any comments to make, like, oh, this is, you know, maybe this would be better for production or, you know, that kind of thing, I would, you know, make my comments along the way as well. And then uh, it was up to Rob Renzetti or, the, or Hasbro or Lauren to kind of... Uh, do what they wish with the information and then we would get it and it would be kind of like the passing of the torch kind of thing. And from there we would interpret it. Well, have you ever had a script that's gone through your hands then that you looked at and thought, wow, this is going to be a challenge to work with? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, episode one and two <laughs> is a prime example, you know, uh, coming up with or, or looking at the epic script that, you know, Lauren put forth, I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm not sure how we're going to do this just yet. Because at the time, I was thinking of My Little Pony like as a kind of a cute little pony show with rainbows. And it wasn't going to be like this kind of epic extravaganza that it ended up being. You know, I didn't know what she was, you know, what she had in her head. So yeah, episode one, I was like, whoa, okay, I'm going to rethink how we're going to do this. <laughs> and, uh, you know, episodes Beyond that, there was always, every episode had its challenges for sure. And uh, especially when we got to like the Discord episode that started season two, it was like, okay, how are we going to do this? You know, this brand new crazy character, it's like always moved around, kind of like Aladdin's genie. And, uh, you know, we just had, we came up with solutions for how to make his body kind of more snake-like and move in different ways that still fluid and, and in flash and all that stuff like i said every episode has challenge so uh, especially when we get a song you know one of daniel's epic songs and we listen to it and it's like oh, okay we gotta match this song with picture so this is gonna be a challenge but it's part of the the fun of the job is like meeting those challenges right if it was easy then we get bored <laughs> well, so was there a specific scene, say, in the second season or a specific element that really stands out to you uh, as a really challenging element that you guys were able to uh, to portray? Um, let me see. Uh, there may have been several. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, that's the, a large question. <laughs> yeah, the smile song was kind of sticks out in my mind as a pretty big challenge just because it's like so many ponies in the scene and that song was so big and and beautiful and cheerful that we were i really wanted to match that and uh, you know when we listen to the song and i sit with the board artists they kind of look at me with these wide eyes and <laughs> scared looks on their faces and i'm like yeah this is this is gonna be epic <laughs> but it'll be worth it you know and so we we find ways to make it work and I think it turned out. Also, the oh, yeah. you know the second part of the wedding episode definitely was uh, another one of those moments. Just looking at the scope of everything, and you know they got all these you know evil minions attacking the city, and you know especially all the the fighting with the clones, and just like wow, how do we pull this off? <laughs> you know, with all the songs and that giant cadence song in the in the crystal caverns and everything it's just you know everything packed into this episode this is 22 minutes you know this is one episode i mean part one had its challenges too but you know it was mostly setting up the emotions and you know getting there but part two was just whoa you know <laughs> <laughs> everything had to come to a head there so i'd say that's the top one one that season finale certainly had the most you know public attention to it of any of the episodes so far. I mean, Hasbro pushed it as a major event, and the yeah. Brony community, of course, you know, gathered and watched in anticipation. And it ended up getting, by a lot of people's standards, the highest ratings of any of the episodes so far. I mean, so again, congratulations on that. That was really great to hear, and, and thanks a lot. I mean, that's another thing about you know having this fan community is that. 
there is an appreciation. You know, we put all this hard work into something like that and we, you know, we send it out into the world, you know, like a baby bird and <laughs> and we watch it grow and everyone responds so wholeheartedly that it's like, yes, you know, it's very positive uh, for us in the on our side. Well, I know that when you guys were producing the first season, of course, this was done well before the whole Brony movement ever started. Of course, Bronies really started once the show started airing. Mm-hmm. And so I know that this may not have been an influence at the time, but especially going into the second season and the production on the second season, knowing about the online community and having this interaction with it, has that affected the production process of the show? And I know that Everyone I've talked to has said, well, you know, we try to make sure that it's a separate process, that they're not incorporating too much of fan elements. But then we see things like in the last episode where, you know, (laughs) where Vinyl Scratch appears or where, you know, these little nods, it seems, uh, to the community. Is that something that you see as a consequence of the online fandom or is that just something that would have happened either way? I think it actually would have happened either way, to be honest. You know, a lot of times when we're making the show, we're kind of becoming fans of the show ourselves. I mean, we have to. We're living it every day. Um, we're right in the thick of it. And a lot of times we go like, ah, we really like that guy. You know, let's, let's, let's use him again. He was fun. Or a little, a little piece of animation that was fun for us or made us laugh or something like that. So we kind of feel similar, like, you know, I'd like to see that again. And and then we put those things in kind of for ourselves and whatever fits the story, whatever suits the scene or the story or the shot or the emotion or whatever, as long as it fits right, you know, obviously you don't want to step outside of the realm of the, the canon of the, of the series or, or what was set up. But we kind of look at those things and go like, oh, yeah, you know what? The, I think people might like this too. It's a little of both, right? We don't want to serve the fans too much because that can lead to becoming stagnant. And Oh, yeah. But we also can see when something would be well received, perhaps, you know, we go, oh, maybe this is something fun to add. But a lot of times I see things that we totally did not intend and fans have pointed out stuff that they think was put in there on purpose for them. <laughs> and I go, oh, I, we did totally did not see that. I think, I mean, they're kind of reading into it, but sure, if that's what you th- want to think then great <laughs> but it, you know it was little happy accidents like that like oh i didn't didn't even think of that you know so it, i think it's inevitable no matter what we do <laughs> well so you have these happy accidents that happen in the show where fans see certain elements and then they take them and they run with them and they make art about them and music about them and i kind of wanted to get your impression i know that you've seen the brony community obviously online but do you keep track of it do you watch it do you see what the fans are putting out there Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, I'm a regular on Equestria Daily just lurking there. <laughs> you know, uh, I'd have to say I, I definitely check that site out every once in a while, plus the YouTube and you know, just kind of anything else that comes my way. I have Google alerts and stuff. So, yeah, I'm always curious uh, as to what's out there and, the, and to see what people have latched onto. I'm just how could I not be? I mean, because uh, you never know. I've seen so many cool things that have been made based on the show and just by fans who are incredibly creative, incredibly talented, too. I've seen some really amazing things out there. So, you know, it's just uh, it's fun. It's like a fun little little thing to, to for me to, to do when I have a chance to just see, OK, what is it today? What's out there today? Well, you've never been to this website, everfreeradio.com, have you? <laughs> um, actually, no, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I don't blame you. It's just this little thing out there that, yeah, yeah it's not worth even seeing. I, well, I'll, maybe I will now. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, okay, but I mean, do you pay particular attention, say, to the fan art that's out there? Or do you listen to the fan music that's being produced? A little bit. I mean, I'm usually pretty swamped with other things. So I just kind of like do a a shallow, shallow end dip, so to speak. (laughs) Just kind (laughs) of like doing a, you know, a broad stroke. Let's see what's out there. But I I don't really dive too deeply. So I'm I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm sure I'm missing hundreds of things that are out there. 
probably in the millions or thousands or <laughs> yeah but there i guess they'll they will be there for me to peruse one day when i have uh retired from <laughs> heaven forbid have retired from the series or something oh, that'll like never that. happen the show yeah, will go I'll on for an, 20 I'll seasons man. yeah i'll be an old man i'll be on this thing till it dies. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to then ask you, you were mentioning earlier about how sometimes when you're working with a script or working with the, the, the production process that you guys will have to make little tweaks or you know little perfections to an episode while it's in production. And I wanted to see if there was any particular change or little detail that you personally added to an episode that fans may know about but may not know that it was your input. Oh, um, I mean, there... I mean, uh, this is kind of asking me to toot my own horn here. Well, that's, um, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I, I mean, like, well, I there'd be hundreds of things. I mean, uh, I'm supervising everything from after the script is approved to, I mean, especially in season two, there's just like so many things that go through me and we sit down with the board artists and come up with visual ways of communicating the script and, and jokes we can add and character things. I mean, they're not, I mean, I'm not the only one. I mean, the board artists come up with things and the design people come up with things. I mean, the design of Queen, Queen Chrysalis or the, the Changeling Queen or whatever, that's Rebecca Dart all the way she she presented that saying you know is this too scary or what do you think of this and i was like holy crap that's awesome mm. you know we gotta use this design like i never would have thought of that and just you know everyone is contributing all the way through to past the animation stage you know so yeah like this the whole show is heavily influenced by all of us it was my idea to do the the felt animation the felt stop motion for that Pinkie pie uh, oh, scene people love in, that. yeah i i was just looking at this opportunity for you know we're going inside of pinky's brain and she's gonna because it was boarded that way it wasn't really written that way but the board artist did this thing where it zooms into her mind and he had a little kind of rinky dink drawings inside her brain and uh, i was just like well that that should look different that should look some you know somewhat interesting and i kind of thought of different ways of doing it and got Hasbro's approval to try something kind of radical. And then I was talking to my wife and we, we kind of decided, Hey, we could do it in like felt or something fun. And, um, and it just kind of like came out of that. And next thing I knew it, I was, you know, doing stop motion animation in my basement. Huh. And I was, you know, I was pretty happy with how it turned out, but, uh, it was just something that just kind of lent itself to doing something fun there. So Well, and I know that some fan artists have picked up on that style. I'm thinking of Pixel Kitty specifically, who, who've gone and done a lot in that felt style just because it, it came off so... I mean, it, it, yeah, it's like you said, it was fun and, and it was original. And of course, fans really ate that up because mm -hmm. there's this fan notion that Pinkie Pie and the fourth wall aren't the best friends and that she breaks it off. And, yeah. <laughs> and so go figure that she would bust into felt. Can you see a uh, maybe a claymation or a uh, another, you know, stop motion sequence coming up at any point? Or is that super secret information? Well, that's it's the kind of thing that's got to be the right the right thing at the right moment for the right character. You know, it, it's it. I have no idea. Maybe, yeah, I don't know. But there. So you won't say just, no. <laughs> well, there's certainly. Um, I don't want to lead anybody to thinking anything, but that was just a situation where it just was perfect fit. It felt. <laughs> <laughs> You know, no pun intended. It felt right <laughs> to do. So if it doesn't feel right to do, I won't push for it. I mean, it has to be something that we can actually do in production. It was something I could just do for fun on my own. And uh, I had a plan B if it didn't go right. You know, always got to have a plan B. Um, any, any chance you could tell us what the plan B was? Uh, well, I was thinking that it could be, you know, maybe just like, uh, stick figures on line paper or something else along that line. Um, but <laughs> something different. Definitely would have been something uh, different than the regular show style, just to kind of see what's, how does Pinkie Pie think in this situation. Um, so, yeah, either way, it would have been 
something interesting. Hopefully well, interesting. And, right. Oh, no. And again, I mean, it, it's just I think that was an example of where the show broke people's expectations. People were not expecting that sort of thing to happen. And, you know, well, in a kid's cartoon about ponies and everyone loved it. So I, yeah. let, let me be the person to say everyone loved that. Oh, thanks. <laughs> it was it was at first a bit, you know, I had to I had to sell everybody on it because, you know, just saying it. Hey, how about we do this? And people are like, oh, are you sure you can do that? I don't know. Maybe we should get this. You know, it's just uh, it's it's not all, you know, sometimes it's not always hard to or not always easy to um, sell everybody on your idea right away. And you have to kind of coax people into it and um, sometimes just do it and show them afterwards, you know. Um, you just got to take that leap. You you mentioned you know the chrysalis uh, design. Was there an element that had to get cut from the last episode that you can share with the fandom or something like that? Well, in chrysalis's case, um, that was the first design that was presented to me, and it was just you know perfect. So uh, that one doesn't have anything. There's nothing else I can tell you there. Um, I'm trying to think of. An example in season two, um, boy, so, so long ago too. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, uh, there's always scenes that are cut out of the show, either for time or for, for whatever reason. You know, there's there's lots of things that end up on the cutting room floor. Um, boy, I I trying I'm trying to f- figure out what an example of. Uh, it's hard because I mean, there's scenes like the. And I think people know about this. I, I've seen online people know about this, but there was a whole scene with Rarity that had to be cut from 204 um, where she was, you know, dressing up Luna to to look like a princess or something like that. And it was storyboarded and everything, but um, that show just was like, you know, it was two minutes over and it was – the scene worked. There was nothing wrong with it, but – I had to cut two minutes out of the show and that scene was exactly two minutes long. And, uh, I had already gone through the whole show and edited everything down to everything is working just right. Where am I going to get an extra two minutes from? (laughs) And I just looked at the, the cost of, if I lose this, what am I really losing? Well, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it's, it's, uh, it's not really hurting the story to, to lose it. People, we tried cutting it out and it didn't really feel wrong. It still fit well with the, with the rest of the show. And so we, I just had to make that decision because everything else was, you know, more important than that scene. So that's one example. Um, but that was, that's an example of like a big cut. Other ones are just like, Oh, we don't need this shot of someone looking this way or you know we don't need to see this guy running away you know it's just kind of like wasting time or something so there's not a lot of you know we try to edit that stuff down at the at the the storyboard stage um and really get the show tight before it goes to animation um and by that time you know by now i've forgotten a lot of it (laughs) to be honest (laughs) So nothing's really coming out at me. I bet you if I look through the archives or talk to people, especially talking to the board artists or the designers or people who've a little closer to the actual material, I bet you they would, they're probably putting their hands up right now if they're listening and saying like, oh, what about this? What about that? You know, (laughs) once it's cut, it's out of my mind. It's gone. I don't need to cry about it. So maybe down the line, then there could be a director's cut DVD or some sort of, you know, behind the scenes documentary, perhaps that, you know, of course, given Hasbro approval. Well, yeah, that would I mean, that would be hard. You, the, the scenes that would I mean, the director's cut would be the cut you'd see because I have to cut it for it's <laughs> like I'm, it's not like I'm cutting the show and it's finished and then someone says you have to cut that scene and I go oh it's most it's all like okay I have to get this down to time and uh, you know I got to get this feeling right and I just spend the time with the editor and we make it work once that's done and it feels good and I'm happy with it then you know it's done and that's the director's cut um <laughs> There, there might be deleted scenes from the animatics that someone could fish through and find, but... 
I think there are many a bronies that would pay good money for yeah. that trash can. <laughs> they might be a little disappointed that, you know, oh, well, yeah, maybe that's that scene isn't really that interesting. <laughs> that's why Luna, it was cut, you know? Luna in a dress, maybe not so much. <laughs> yeah, sorry, everybody. We had to lose it for time. Well, I remember back in the day when EQD posted about somebody had dug through Hasbro's website and had discovered Luna in the pink frilly dress. And I, I remember at the time thinking, you know, this is one of those things that being cut, I'm OK with that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I should thank you on behalf of all the other Luna fans out there for getting Luna into the season two more, because I know that at, you know after season one, everybody was saying, where's Luna? Where's Luna? Yeah. Um, you know, and it, it, as a big Luna fan, I, I should say it, was, it made me very happy, first of all, to see that fourth episode, which I know is, you know, a credit to the writers and also to the storyboarders and the animators as well. But also, you know, in the season finale, she was there. So thank you for uh, for bringing her back. Yeah, I mean, uh, we tried to sneak her in there. It was sort of like something that, you know, I don't know if this is, you know, too secretive information, but she wasn't really written into those episodes. And we tried to, you know, we realized that it's like, ah, there's this whole character that, you know, is a part of this that we have kind of, you know, not entirely utilized, but it's just not, it's not really part of the story. So uh, we tried to make it feel natural that, you know, this is why we're not seeing her. She's taking over for the nighttime and the, the everything happened at day. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that actually answers a question I've had for a while. <laughs> well, yeah, Sibzi in her interview with us a, a month ago also mentioned that, you know, Luna had been added at the, kind of the last minute, um, you know, to include her in the scene. And, you know, the fans have really run with that. They've come up with all these sorts of different, you know, comics and <laughs> and various things to explain where Luna had been during that episode. Uh, and I know some people, <clears throat> myself perhaps, are considering writing fanfics uh, explaining that. My favorite one that's out there is the uh, the idea that she's a video gamer and she was too busy playing video games to notice <laughs> that the Changeling army was attacking. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, she's a princess of the night, you know? She's sleeping during the day. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I guess I guess she sleeps pretty heavily. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, the shield that was up around the city is uh, soundproof as well. <laughs> oh, okay, so she she's sleeping on the moon then? Or? <laughs> yeah. Sure. <laughs> we'll this we'll is, go with that. This is just this none of this is is should be considered canon or anything. I'm not I'm not spoiling <laughs> it or leaking. I'm just having fun. Yeah, no, we can uh yeah. <laughs> I think that the fans have all their own theories anyway. Yeah, and and that's a and that's actually a great thing. I kind of like that, you know. Leave leave something up to the viewer to kind of fill in the blank, right? It, it's like all the great movies that kind of give a little question at the end and um, lets you kind of speculate on what really happened, and it, it kind of opens up your imagination a bit, and and it definitely. Uh, bronies have and all the fans have you, know, you see all these fanfics and and uh, little animations and edited videos and stuff like that and it's great it's fun it's fun interactive uh stuff that you can do with your favorite show well and someone once told me and i maybe they told me this maybe i read it somewhere but it seemed to be wise either way that the best kind of writing is the kind that doesn't tell the reader how to feel. It leaves the reader to make their own impression. And I think that the show does that to some extent. I mean, if it's too blatantly obvious that a character is supposed to be, you know, sad, sad, the, the audience is going to have a hard time empathizing. And I think that's kind of part of it, almost a realism, ironically. Yeah, I mean, there's a subtlety involved. And, you know, we try to achieve that. But, you know, we also you know, want to be sure that if, if this is a sad scene that the viewer is feeling that, you know, somewhat and, uh, you know, and it's also, you know, intended for young children. So we, we can't be too, uh, subtextual. Uh, they have to be able to get it too. You know, if, if, uh, if a kid is, if it goes over kids' heads too much, then, you know, you're losing your, your core audience. Um, 
it, it should be it should play to everybody well so i guess then going to a larger scope of a, of a question what in general, in your artistic career, have been your biggest influences, and how have those shaped what you've been doing with Pony? Hmm. Um, well, definitely, like the history of animation has certainly, obviously, influenced me. I mean, I'm a big fan of the old Fleischer cartoons with Popeye and Betty Boop, and the old Ub Works Mickey Mouse's. I, I mean, a lot of people kind of poo poo that old style as old, but I love it. I still watch them and enjoy them. Um, as well as of course the old, uh, Lo- uh, Looney Tunes and, and all the, the classic cartoons. Um, but, uh, I have also taken a liking to a lot of Japanese stuff that I've seen over the years. And uh, there's a lot of really cool filmmaking and techniques and, and things that they do to kind of uh, translate their manga into animation that is really amazing. There's some like awesome, awesome animation coming out of there that has never been seen in in uh, the West as like a style that's really been done as well. They just seem to know how to animate effects and certain things. I'd say I'm a bit influenced by that as well as just kind of modern flash and also 3d and and other like artsy films. I I just kind of try and take in everything. I I'm, I'm a bit of a Jack of all trades. There's no real one style that I'd say is the one that is me. It's kind of a problem for me. (laughs) (laughs) I'd feel like I probably would like to try just about any kind of, uh, style if someone was to hire me to direct a 3d action film I, i'd be sure i'd love to try that i want to go there you know or anything you know it's just uh it's fun to do new things i like to challenge myself well and i know that there are a lot of anime and manga fans among bronies and i know that a lot of them have really kind of pointed to certain elements of the show that kind of draw inspiration from that so i think it's interesting you bring that up for those anime nerds out there, kind of like myself, I'm, I dabble a little, <laughs> mm-hmm. a little. Um, are there any specific shows that, that you particularly like uh, from that style? Well, definitely. I mean, there's a a lot. I mean, uh, I, I'm just thinking. <laughs> it's kind of vague. yeah. Thinking back to you know when I was a teenager and discovering Akira for the first time, I and mean, I was just like, whoa, this is. This is like nothing I've ever seen before, like in a Disney film or anything. It's so gritty and cool. Or like Fooly Cooly. There's some really amazing stuff oh, yeah. in that. Cutie, the, there's like a, a Cutie Honey um, t- a DVD movie that they made. I can't remember. It's like a, one of the modern ones. Uh, there's so many different ones. I keep kind of rebooting <laughs> that stuff. But yeah, one of the cutie honeys, the, the most recent one that was done by Gainax, I think. I can't remember which studio did it. But that one was, I love that. As well as just, I don't know. There's, I'm, I'm not like super following all of it. So, I mean, I'll see something and go, that was really cool and I'll I'll like it. But I don't, that's about as far as it goes. Like, I'll <laughs> you know, maybe watch it a bit more, but I won't, I don't really get that deep into who they are and how they did it and all that stuff. I'm, I just kind of get inspired from yeah. an arm's length. It's just, I guess it's just the who, who I am. I'm not, I guess I'm not that obsessive. <laughs> Maybe I could be more. <laughs> well, I think that some people that get into anime though, don't have to necessarily be obsessed with it. No, no, definitely I know not. That in yeah. my, um, I know in my case, um, I stumbled across, uh, Hayao Miyazaki's spirit in a way. And that just blew me oh, away. Oh yeah, of course. Miyazaki. Uh, yeah. How could I not mention him? Oh, he's, uh, he's, his work is incredible. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and one of the first animes I watched that wasn't a Miyazaki afterwards, just to see, okay, is this, you know, a fluke mm-hmm. <laughs> is, uh, Miyazaki's anime somehow an exception to the genre. And I watched Akira and then, yeah, I saw Fully Cooly back when it was first airing on adult swim, mm, I think. Oh, yeah. And, uh, 
I mean, and it just it kind of blew me away what people could do because it seems to me that there are different types of uh, Japanese animation. There's the really intense, very vibrantly animated style, and then there's the more stagnant pan and scan sort yeah. of thing. And I've heard a lot of people compare what DHX is doing and what you are doing with My Little Pony to that more action based style, and so. Mm especially you get these scenes where for example the one that comes to mind right now is in the uh, second discord episode where twilight kind of stands up and says i'm gonna save equestria and there's this kind of flare behind her and you know and it's got that kind of anime feel Mm -hmm. to it but it's still very active yeah it's uh, kind of pushing that determination in her stance and just kind of you know making a a visual statement as well as uh, her acting oh absolutely and i think it works (laughs) i love those scenes to me it's it's one of my favorite elements of the show a lot of people have picked up on that. I hope we don't. I hope we don't. Sorry, I, I don't mean to interrupt. I was just going to say, I hope we don't overuse it too much. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I now come to think of it, and it's partially because this was the desktop that just cycled onto my computer. There's a scene in the uh, the Spike episode in season two where the Phoenix is defending its family, and it just shoots out these beams of light. Oh, and it had yeah. that same kind of effect. And when I saw that, I had to pause the episode and just take it in because it was so well done. I think that you guys aren't overusing it at all. I think it's effective. And I mean, and I think it really does kind of play into what a lot of people enjoy about Eastern animation is that it can highlight things like that. Yeah. And that was a very beautiful scene. Definitely. When I saw that done, I was just like, wow, that that is awesome. You know, good job. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's cool, and and uh, you know when it's done in with the right emotion behind it, in the right re- for the right reason, and all that, then you know it's warranted. But you know you don't want to be doing it for every second scene, every time someone says "I've got it," you know, it's just <laughs> it'll get tired. <laughs> Don't make it too common, you know. So you've got to have a broad repertoire of various elements that you can use. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Every shot tells a story in some ways. Like a picture's worth a thousand words, and every every time you make a cut to a new scene, there's there's a length, there's a something you're saying with that. If it's a down shot, you're saying something. If it's an up shot, you're saying something. Two shot, close up, wide, whatever, you know. And we always trying to help the visuals tell the story of from the character's point of view or from the point of view that the character's looking or whatever, and to help the audience really feel what is going on so that you're right there with them. That's that's the goal anyway. I think that if a picture is worth a thousand words, that may explain why so many of these fan fictions are so long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know who you are. I don't have time to read them all. <laughs> <laughs> I barely have time to read anything. Uh, yeah. yeah, but um, well, I mean, and again, it's it. I think that the show definitely displays a real good variation. And actually, I was going to then mention on the episode "Mystery on the Canterlot Express." There's a great sequence of scenes where Pinkie Pie is accusing various ponies of being guilty of ruining the cake. And it shifts styles. It shifts from kind of an old timey, you know, villain style to, you know, a James Bond sort of thing right. to a kung fu scene, which is my personal favorite. <laughs> <laughs> the thought of a donkey with a katana, just it's brilliant. Yeah. She's either a donkey or a mule, but either way, she's a mule, uh, you yeah. know, oh, she's a mule. OK, yeah. so fans, forgive me. She's a mule. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that must have been fun for you guys to work on, just to have that kind of variation within an episode. Oh, yeah. I I was really having fun with that one. The scene with the old timey thing is probably my favorite one, actually, because it, it just kind of worked so well. And I love the effect that we were able to achieve with that. And there was a piece of music that we grabbed for it that at the animatic stage just to kind of, you know, help sell the idea of the silent film. Oh, yeah. And we just kind of downloaded whatever piece of piano music that said, oh, silent movie piano. And we just stuck it on there without much thought and watched it. And darn it, it matched perfectly to the picture in such a way (laughs) that it was emphasizing things on screen that we didn't even expect. And I was like, wow, how did that? That was like, that's a happy accident right there. But I love those kind of moments where you, it just kind of gels and it's like, ah, perfect. And then we kind of give that to Will Anderson the, to score it. And it's like, here, it's kind of done. So 
can you just kind of recreate it in your with your instruments and kind of match to how it works here because it's just bang on but yeah i really like that the katana part was pretty cool too a little reminiscent of uh of working on puka because we did all that stuff all the time uh, so many like split screen and letterboxing and dramatic shots of eyes and and swords and stuff like that on that show so i kind of enjoyed that that's one thing i do miss about you know working on puka it was a lot of fun just the kind of extreme you know filmmaking that i was trying to do on that thing just wish that they were longer form (laughs) well and i remember there was a another segment kind of similar to that you know capturing a different style in hurricane fluttershy where they're showing that you know that informational video oh yeah yeah as a uh, informational video nerd for me that was a lot of fun to to see and it it, you know all credit to you and your team for you know for capturing those you know that, that kind of impression i think that again is an example of how the show really exceeds people's expectations because as a fan when you haven't read the script in advance or you don't know what the show is going to be about you go in, you maybe have a synopsis and you know, okay, Hurricane Fluttershy, Fluttershy is finding her own inner strength or something like that. And when a new episode comes out as a fan, you watch it and you think, okay, well, this is going to be an episode focused on Fluttershy. You don't expect to see a little detail like that, like a film strip style clip or a really well done water tornado, <laughs> you know, or you know, <laughs> those little details in there, I think are what really suck in a lot of bronies. I know it's what did it to me back in season one, because a lot of us, you know, come into it with the presumption that it's going to be like most other animated shows that it's going to be, you know, a pretty straightforward script, a pretty straightforward, you know, approach and, and a predictable in multiple ways. But when you guys put that extra effort in and put those little details in, I think everybody online, at least that I've ever talked to or have seen really appreciates those and then runs with them. I think that's where you get that kind of scrutiny of details because people see that you guys put that kind of attention in. Yeah. Well, yeah, that uh, 1950s informational film was fun. It was in the script too. So when I saw that in the script, I was like, oh, ooh, here's a fun thing we can do visually. We can do this in like a scratchy old film with bad animation and <laughs> You know, when I see those things written in there, it, it gets it gets me excited too. You know, like hey, there's an opportunity to try something different. Let's really do it authentic as much as we can. And and uh, no kid at six year old, no six year old is really going to understand what the heck this film on a reel to reel is. <laughs> but uh, but someone will, and and it's it's a fun little bit, and then it works within the show canon too like you know why wouldn't why couldn't they have old films well okay so outside of pony and obviously we can't talk about the upcoming season this this fall but yeah there's an there's an upcoming season i'm i've been told there is oh okay i think john delancey said so (laughs) oh okay (laughs) you know how he likes to say things yeah (laughs) outside of that upcoming season that apparently is happening are there any other upcoming projects or things that you're working on that you would like to mention or you can tease us with well i would like to be able to but i life is so full of pony it's hard to do anything on the side i mean i that's true of many bronies as well (laughs) yeah (laughs) that's true yeah, I mean, I've worked on, you know, on my free time and worked on some little little things that just in my own little projects or trying to like pitch a series idea or something like that. But uh, those things are, you know, very difficult to get off the ground and uh, don't really have anything to report. I mean, I, I wish I did, but I guess it's just upcoming season. <laughs> <laughs> you hear that, bronies? Jason Teeson is absorbed by Pony 2. No, I, actually, I think a lot of people are going to be reassured by that because, I mean, it just kind of goes to that, you know, you guys are putting that kind of level of attention and effort into yeah. this upcoming season, too. It's a full time job, that's for sure. Yeah. You attended a Brony Con back last year. Do you see yourself attending any conventions this upcoming year? Like I know there's going to be, you know, I know Brony Con's coming up this upcoming weekend, June 30th, but there's also in Seattle, Everfree Northwest uh, in August. And then there's going to be Carolot Gardens in Ohio 
in September and then Equestria LA in November. I mean, do you see yourself going to another one of these conventions at some point? Yeah, I, uh, I definitely could. Um, the only reason why I'm not really going to ever free is, uh, cause my wife is going to be giving birth like right around that time. And I don't want to be away <laughs> from, from that. I don't want to be out of town. So, oh yeah, that if, if to go back to your previous question, you know, upcoming projects. Well, you know, that would be one of them. <laughs> Second child for the family. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, the only issue is, you know, just my time. I'd have to. Sometimes it it kind of gets in the way of production if I have to take a day off or a couple of days off work, or especially if we're going to have a new baby in the house, I'm I'm going to have to be more around. So, but if I can work it in, I'll go for sure. It just needs to work with my time. Well, and by the way, all the best to you and your wife, and congratulations in advance. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. It's a little nerve wracking. <laughs> thinking about how to manage a, a second one. But I mean, people do it. I'll be fine. <laughs> I knew someone once with 16 siblings. But then again, I live in the Midwest and you need farm hands, right? Yeah. I think my grandmother was, on my dad's side, was one of 18 children. Um, oh, wow. So, uh, yeah, it's I, I can't imagine that. <laughs> I have one last question for you. Yeah. And it's an evil question. And every time I ever ask it, some of the VAs I've talked to have had clear cut answers. Some have just said that have repeated. Yes, that's an evil question. But that is this. If you could ask something from the fandom, if there was something you'd like to see from the fandom, what would it be? Well, I've actually been asked this question before, and I've said in the past, just keep doing great stuff that you're doing. But, uh, you know, you know, that that game that fighting is magic that's been worked on for a long time i'm oh, yes. seeing that and i would have to say finish that game already so i can play it <laughs> oh you have just spoken what every single brony ever has been thinking for the past <laughs> six months they have been teasing us all <laughs> mm -hmm. so if they can um, finish that game you know provide a copy online that people can play even if it's I don't know what the legal ramifications are of that, but uh, it looks pretty cool. I've seen the, you know, the animated little demos of it and stuff, and I'm like, wow, that really well done, actually. So it'd be fun to play it. Yeah, that's main six, and I know they've been working really hard on it. And uh, I'm back in January when I was at that BronyCon – it was very, very, very well received there. And some guy ran up to the stage with his wallet and tried to give it to them. Um, you know, <laughs> people, people definitely want that game. <laughs> All right. Well, everyone, Jason Thiessen is the supervising director for a little show, My Little Pony, <laughs> Friendship is Magic. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Uh, you're very welcome. Pleasure's all mine. All right. And you've been listening to Everfree Radio. Everyone. Welcome to Everfree Radio. This is Final Draft, and I'm here today with Jason Teeson, the supervising director of My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, this small show, this kind of upstart program that some of you may have heard of. But anyway, <laughs> welcome, Jason. Hi. Well, I'm glad to be here. Well, you know, first of all, let me just say it's a real honor to be able to speak with you. I know that it's just been a crazy ride this whole year with all that's been going on in the community and with all of the things that have been happening in season two. Let me just say right off the bat, you know, congratulations on a really successful season. I mean, these were some of the best episodes I've seen. Oh, wow. Thanks a lot. Yeah, it's a wild ride. I mean, it's only been, what, two, two years for the show being actually on the air and just the community that's exploded around it and for it it's just unbelievable i i've never seen anything like it in my lifetime so that's saying i don't know how much that's saying but <laughs> uh, from my perspective it's saying a lot um so i'm amazed good job to you guys for sticking with the show and thanks for loving it it really makes my job a heck of a lot easier <laughs> and uh and rewarding 
to see the kind of enthusiasm for the show that you guys have. Well, and I think in the end, it's actually almost a symbiotic relationship. I mean, when I've talked to yeah. other production, you know, members of the cast and crew, you know, they say that because there's this supportive online community that's showing this kind of a positive reaction, that it encourages more musical sequences in the second season and a lot more grand scale sorts of animations. Would you attribute that then to being a little more comfortable with the format and using, say, flash animation? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, I mean, a lot of that comes from the scripts, of course, and the songs that are being made. I mean, Daniel's definitely stepped it up, too, as well as Will with the musical score. And also the storyboard artists, you know, season two kind of started a new thing with us with Jim Miller as a storyboard supervisor. And we kind of set up new systems to kind of improve ourselves and get to a point where we can get grander as well as all the production stuff with animation and layout. It's just an inevitable step, you know, hopefully, that you improve on yourself. So, yeah, I'd say yes. Well, <laughs> I should say, too, that about a month ago, we interviewed Sabrina Alberghetti, a.k.a. Sibzy, about her work with the show. And she said that, you know, that this season has been a, a little bit of a different dynamic, a little more uh, flexible in a sense, just for the same reason that you've been talking about, that, you know, you, once you get more used to a system, you can do more with it. And I know that she credited you a lot with some of the, you know, innovations that have happened this season. So, you know, again, congratulations on that. Oh, thanks. Well, I guess you should credit me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, season one, I mean, any anytime you start with a, a series at the very beginning, there's always these hurdles that you got to get over, like setting up the characters. Who are they? Everyone has to get on the same page. Who is Rarity? Well, we didn't know. And, and, you know, only Lauren knew. And, uh, and even then, it was like kind of nebulous in that sense. Like once we got the voice actors in, that kind of helped them to do more as well with the show. And it kind of builds up on top of itself, I think. Yeah, it certainly keeps fueling the fire and uh, gets us uh, pumped for the next season and uh, really wanting to try and top ourselves or at least keep that energy flowing. Well, and it's definitely working. I think in a lot of ways, season two had a lot of, you know, bigger and and just more amazing elements than season one even had. And season one was incredible. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> the bronies out there would rip me to shreds if I claimed season one was in any way deficient. But you guys really expanded the scope a bit in season two. Yeah, I mean, we tried to, you know, learn from uh, problems and stuff that we encountered in production to try and make the storyboarding and the, the storytelling better as well as animation and the layouts and everything, you know, it's just, we try to build upon what we've already done, right? And it's, it's always easier in the, the subsequent seasons in a way because you have assets, especially in Flash, you have assets built, things you've already set up and you have systems in place and production lines that are starting to gel and, and everything. So, and especially if everybody stays on board and you get the same crew, people know the rules, they know, you know, how to do things and we, that we've, problems that we've solved don't have to be resolved again because people know, okay, I, this is how I do it and things like that. So it just kind of gets to a point where we're just sort of speaking each other's language and stuff. So that definitely is good to hear that we're improving. <laughs> <laughs> well, so maybe in a sense, then you guys kind of got the basis down and now you're able to kind of work a little bit more with the format, work a little bit more with the resources you have to kind of try new things. Because one thing that I noticed over season two that I know that a lot of fans appreciated was that there were a lot more... me. That's a skill that I think being a director definitely pushes you to develop. Well, and I was going to say, too, I mean, you've got a lot of different groups to work with in your position. I mean, you've got the storyboard yeah. artists, you've got the layout artists, you've got the, the flash animation programmers, you've got the people over, I suppose, at Top Draw, you know, and you kind of have to coordinate mm -hmm. between all those different groups, don't you? Yeah, and not only that, but we don't make one episode at a time. I mean, we do, but... I'm involved in multiple episodes at once. Like one will be in script, one will be in voice record, one will be in design, another one is in storyboard, all the way through to final mix. I could, like on Puka, it was much dip more difficult like that, where because they were little seven minute shorts, we had the entire spectrum. Every, there was an episode in script all the way all through to there was something in mix, and I had to keep my brain peeled for 
each one of those episodes at whatever stage they are and people come up to me and ask questions like, oh, in this scene, uh, what do I do here? And they wouldn't even tell me what episode it is. And I'd be like, okay, I just kind of extrapolate from what they're asking me. Oh, that's episode 22. And I know that story is about this. So you must be meaning this. Okay, here's the answer. And it was just like this Rolodex of episodes I had to have in my head at any given time and scenes. And even, you know, on today on Puka, like, or sorry, on, on Pony, people ask me things and like, oh, uh, or I come up with a, a, a scene that's like, oh, this is similar to that scene in this episode. Maybe we can extract some elements from that and, and repurpose them and make a new animation out of it. You know, you know, secrets out, we reuse things. <laughs> but anyway, solidify how they sounded and how they moved and all that stuff is in the beginning of the season, of the beginning of any series. It's kind of a struggle. It's just a learning curve, right? Mm-hmm. But once you get on to another season, you're just kind of picking up where you left off. So it's, uh, again, should always be improving on yourself. Well, so I kind of want to take a step back and look at your broader career. And, you know, you'll have to correct me if IMDb fails me again. <laughs> and it's failed <laughs> me in the past. You've worked on, on a few other shows before this. It's, uh, what the internets, what the interwebs tell me is that you've worked on Puka and you've worked on uh, George of the Jungle. And my question is, what did you learn from working on those shows that you've since applied to working as the supervising director on My Little Pony? Um, I think the most I learned was from Puka. I mean, I was only on George for a brief period. You know, I was in between seasons, actually. I did two seasons of Puka. And in between those seasons, while there wasn't really anything going on, I moved on to George and supervised the animation. But that was only for the first six episodes and we're just kind of setting it up. But for Puka, I definitely, well, I learned directing in a way. I mean, I started out as an assistant director and I kind of learned, you know, how to deal with crews and getting my ideas out there in, in a way that other people understand and just working the whole system, learned about taking something and moving it from script all the way to the final mix and communicating with everybody. Then directing is is like 90% communicating. You know, I, I really have to take a vision that I have in my head and try to communicate that to someone else who is obviously not in my head. You know, how do I do that? How do I get them on the same page? 